I'm very excited actually now to introduce our first academic panel. And Professor David Yermak, who chairs the finance department here at Stern, will introduce his panelists. But this sounds like an exciting topic, actually, and, and very apropos. The topic is opportunity in the digital asset space and uh, or opportunity, opportunity and controversy in the digital asset space. And I'd like to hand it over now to Professor Yermak. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. And yeah, don't forget about the controversy. Exactly. <laughs> that's mostly what we're going to hear about for the next 45 minutes. So we have three academic speakers, about 15 minutes each, and we'll have a few minutes left at the end for Q&A. So the first speaker is Bruce Mizrock from Rutgers University. Thank, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, everyone should have a copy of the handout. And I should also know while I'm fumbling around here that um, that my co-author, Ellie Kepengut, is here today. And uh, he's uh, uh, graduating Rutgers University this year and will be joining Jane Street in the, in, in the fall. So it's a very exciting uh, opportunity uh, and uh, an opportunity for us both to uh, talk to you. And I'm just having a little trouble with my Adobe. Um, in any case, I'll keep talking while, while I get my slides going. Um, the uh, the uh, merge of the Ethereum network was an important uh, change in certainly the, the Ethereum network itself and also, I think, for the entire digital asset space. And the primary reason and motivation was that um, the concept that was being used for block validation prior to the merge, as it's called, and I'll explain in just a second why it's called the merge, um, was due to the fact that uh, proof of work and very energy intensive uh, concept, which required use of uh, large networks of computers literally distributed across the world using tremendous amounts of, uh, of energy. And that was uh, uh, just imposing a gigantic re resource cost on the economy as a whole. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, it was uh, ultimately necessary to um, uh, move towards this new proof of work concept. The energy consumption of the Ethereum network at the time uh, approach the annual consumption of a small country, for example, like Costa Rica. And clearly this is uh, an excessive amount of uh, energy usage and, and entirely unnecessary because we know from work on cryptographic technology and so on that there are lots and lots of other ways to validate blocks. And so the use of massive networks of computers was a, was a waste. And um, what we'll show when I finally get my slides going here, and it looks like Adobe is just not going to cooperate for me, um, is that uh, the energy usage was cut by basically almost 100%. It fell down to a tiny fraction of what was available before. And you'll see those graphs in just a second that show the uh, massive reduction of energy usage uh, on the network. Now, our analysis, Ellie and I, was to look at then what happened to the network after the merge, which is to say after um, the time that uh, the system moved, the, the entire network moved towards uh, proof of stake rather than proof of work. And uh, hopefully this will be uh, useful uh, for you now that now that I have the slides. Here's first the slide quickly on the dramatic reduction in energy usage of the network. And uh, the uh, private cost of this was, of course, extremely high transfer fees. Um, and I'll actually I'll let you read the slide and talk about something else that's not here, which was that um, there were, of course, uh, you know, tremendous cases in which there were extremely high gas fees, just two that immediately come to mind. Uh, there was the Board Apes incident that took place in 2021. This was some NFTs that were extremely popular, and everybody wanted to be the first to bid on the NFTs that, of the Board Ape collection. And there were gas fees, for example, in the hour in the hour that the NFTs became available, of over four thousand dollars. So we have a network that's being validated using a block completion concept that has an excessively high uh, amount of energy usage. And then an excessively high private cost with some real surprises in which the transfer fees dramatically exceed the amount that's actually being acquired within the transfer. Um, so proof of stake then was the way to go. And I'm advancing to that now. Um, and here we're going to rely on validators. Validators um, are required to basically have 24-7 connectivity to the network. The reason for that is, is that while they're rarely selected to choose or, or validate an individual block, um, it is the case then that they need to be ready because they're selected randomly to, to, to do this. And so once a validator is selected, he or she has to verify the code, for example, in the smart, uh, you know, in the smart uh, contract uh, examples. And, and again, smart contracts are, are not rare. They're, in fact, uh, extremely common because almost all the ERC-20 stable coins that are widely transferred on the Ethereum network um, require, uh, re require smart contracts. 
So uh, first we have a block proposer. This is followed by a group of validators. And then finally, the block is finalized in what's called the next epic. And in this epic, then uh, we have a checkpoint and then the block is actually finalized. The reason that we then call our paper the merge, and by the way, the paper is now uh, published in commodities. Um, we call it the merge because the proof of stake had actually been created in parallel on something called the beacon chain. And really the move to proof of stake, which took place in September of 2022, um, was a unification of the beacon chain alongside the uh, Ethereum mainnet. And so uh, I, I want to emphasize that this was a dramatic achievement. I know I have someone from uh, associated with Ethereum talking next, so I won't uh, go on too long, but uh, this was a very, very complicated uh, technology achievement, which was to keep a network running and then merge it with another network that was already running without crashing the plane. And what our study is gonna show you is that in fact, they did succeed in doing that. So um, where do you stake your uh, ether in order to uh, validate blocks? And again, we're keeping out the smallest retail investors here in part, both because of sophistication and also because of financial constraints, you needed to stake 32 ether in order to become a validator. What we're looking at here is the beacon contract that uh, trades obviously on both the Ethereum and, uh, and beacon networks. And heading into the merge, there were 13.2 million ETH staked into that contract, um, and roughly in the neighborhood of about 400,000 validators. So the first and perhaps uh, most important social contribution of the proof of stake shift was this dramatic decline in energy consumption that I previously talked about, um, and basically cutting uh, it down to almost 100%. Um, and I'll leave out as a breadcrumb, perhaps for a future conversation, just to say, um, while the energy usage has gone down, um, it's not necessarily the case that the network has gotten substantially faster. And it's also not necessarily the case that uh, more transactions can be included in a block. And so we'll see as we talk uh, in the last bit of the presentation that there are other networks that still um, are, are faster than, uh, than Ethereum and certainly also uh, networks that have lower fees than Ethereum, even after, after the switch of, to proof of stake. So what do we do when we, uh, as economists, look at a particular network? And uh, the analogy always here, particularly if you're thinking about stable coins, is we want to make some comparison to the banking system. So as we look here, we see the blocks that were then validated uh, by uh, the top 10 validator groups here following the merge. And this is looking at the month after the merge. So this is from September 16th to October 16th. And so Herfindahl indices are never particularly uh, that useful, but we can reference it to the Herfindahl of the uh, miners that were going that, that were validating blocks prior to the merge, and we see that the concentration is lower, about 19% less concentrated. And you'll see some names appear that seem familiar. I'll just I don't have much time to talk about each, but um, almost 50% of the blocks are being validated by um, MEV uh, uh, entities. These are folks who try to extract value by reordering the transactions within the block. It's perhaps not very promising that they have such a large percentage. But then we also see participation by large centralized exchanges like Coinbase. Um, and then finally, we'll actually see uh, a bit later, uh, I think it's on the next slide, discussion of the Lido token, which is a way for small investors to actually participate in, uh, in, in the rewards that come from block validation. So uh, I think I've just summarized everything that's on this particular slide. Who are the validators? I've talked about the flashbots. I've talked about Lido. Lido is a, a token then that trades on, on chain and you can purchase a, a stake in, in Lido and indirectly then obtain the rewards that Lido is, is, is using to maintain its presence on the network and, and validate, as you can see, a large percentage of the blocks. So there is a way for small investors, either through their centralized exchange like Coinbase or either through uh, tokens like Lido to participate. You don't necessarily need to have 32 ETH, which is, uh, again, a fairly substantial amount of money in order to be a block validator. So ironically, though, if we measure transfer fees in the month after the merge, the transfer fees are actually up just slightly. And, and don't focus on the USD price because the USD price is um, implicitly influenced also by the transaction, the, the, the exchange rate between ETH and USD. So uh, while there is a decline in ETH in USD terms for transfer fees, uh, the gas fee, which is uh, up above, is uh, actually statistically significantly larger for Ether. Um, and uh, it is down slightly, but in, in a statistically insignificant way for uh, ERC-20 tokens. And so uh, one might ask, why are the gas fees up if we're using so much less energy? 
And the answer, I think, is in part on the next slide, which re reveals the block income. So what were the rewards to then being a block validator or, or, or I should say a, a block uh, a creator prior to the merge? Well, you receive not only the transfer fees in the block, that's still the same as today, but in addition to that, you also receive Ethereum rewards. And the Ethereum rewards went down uh, over time, but at the time of the merge, just prior to the merge, the Ethereum rewards for uh, forming a block were two ETH. And so that was a substantial amount of additional income. And what we see is, is that block income, whether it's by the, the miners, as you see prior to the dash line, or by the validators after it, um, are in doubt, in, indeed down quite a bit. And so because of the loss of block rewards, um, even though transfer fees are slightly higher, at least for Ether only transactions, it's nonetheless the case that this is not as lucrative a proposition uh, uh, be, being a block, uh, block, a miner or being a block validator in the uh, post-merge world. So what are the returns to staking? Well, there are a variety of models and um, we're just highlighting one here due to Pintail. And uh, it depends definitely on the number of validators. It also depends, of course, on uh, the uh, uh, amount of uh, transactions that are taking place in the network because validators will also get those fees. Um, but there's an estimate that on your 32 staked ETH, you're going to earn something like 1.49 ETH. So that annualizes to a yield of 4.64%. But if the number of validators were to double, of course, then this return would fall, not, not fall proportionally, but still fall to 3.28%. Um, I don't have much time in this very short presentation, but I'll mention that we have completed what's known as the Shanghai upgrade, in which validators are now able to remove their ETH. They were not able to do so prior to that, that fork, which just took place uh, less than a week ago. So I'll briefly mention it and, and move on. Um, and the consequence of this then is that the total ETH supply, and I should be clear, this is the total unstaked ETH supply, has actually then been deflationary since the merge. And this follows the very, very steady increase that you can see leading into it. Um, so overall, you would think that these things would be relatively favorable for the price of Ether. And in fact, that has been the case, although uh, certainly the boom that we've seen recently in both Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, is not an event of the merge. It in fact uh, arises much later in calendar year 2022 and into 2023. So I want to compare in the limited time left uh, the Ethereum network to two of its competitors. Uh, the first is a poly this is the Polygon network, which is uh, in, the in the terminology of the blockchain, a layer two scaling solution, which means it operates on top of the Ethereum network and it will uh, uh, at discrete time sync with the Ethereum network. Um, it creates a separate chain, but it's faster as a consequence. And then it has higher transactions per second and lower fees. Uh, Solana is an open source layer one blockchain that um, has achieved really, really high latencies and Certainly was my favorite blockchain until I think I learned more about how much of the volume on Solana was actually coming from uh, FTX. So look at the transfer fee comparisons. Let's focus on the fact that both Polygon and Solana are substantially lower in US dollar terms than Ether, both pre and post. And Solana gives you some idea potentially of what the cost of transfers could be on a proof of stake network. They're in the, as you can see, the sub uh, penny uh, level. So substantially lower still than the Ethereum network after the merge. Um, finally, in terms of volume, uh, the Ethereum volume in the month after the merge uh, falls a bit. Um, if we look just at Tether, one of the large stable coins that trades natively on all three networks, we see that um, volumes were down on every network except for Solana. And then finally, uh, we can uh, look at speed. And again, uh, just showing you that there's literally no comparison then between the speed on a network like Solana and a network like Ethereum, even with proof of stake. And um, this isn't to say that there are the possibilities that in some future uh, that we could have a, an Ethereum network that approaches those latencies. But um, there certainly is some academic literature, which is cited in our paper, which discusses the potential limits on Ethereum. And basically, the trade-off is between speed and security. And, and I think that this is a valid concern. If you look at the history of the Solana network, there certainly have been many, many instances, many more instances of, of capricious activity on Solana than there has been on Ethereum. So our main findings, just to summarize, is that we've seen a large social benefit in the massive decrease of energy. Um, perhaps, uh, un, un, unfortunately, the, uh, the flash bots are now the largest set of stakers in the ETH deposit contract. Uh, transactions fees have, of course, risen since the merge, at least in ETH terms, um, and the circulating supply of ETH is now deflationary. Uh, so, of course, since we uh, 
published our paper and also then uh, uh, agreed to participate in this conference, uh, the merge took place with, uh, or I shouldn't say the merge, the Shanghai Fork took place. And the key thing of the Shanghai Fork is that we're going to see as in the red bars, the ability then of validators to start removing ETH from the staking contract. This had not been allowed. And uh, I'll just say that Shanghai took place basically on schedule. Um, there have been, as you can see, substantial withdrawals and a decline in the total number of validators on the chain since, the, uh, since they've been allowed to withdraw their, their stake. Um, we will almost certainly have a paper coming soon on what happened after the Shanghai fork. I'll just say that we're going to need a little bit more time to see the full implications of this because of the fact that it still is taking time for all the validators to, in fact, remove their ETH because they need to be done on chain. Um, last, uh, policy questions. Um, I think this will also be part of the later discussion, I'm sure. Um, our proof of stake assets, digital securities, uh, Chairman Gensler of the SEC has certainly suggested that the answer is yes. And in specific regarding what's in our space, Kraken had a similar program to Coinbase, which allowed retail investors on their centralized platform to stake and earn ETH rewards for validating. Um, and Kraken, in fact, discontinued this as part of its settlement with the SEC. So certainly this is uh, an area of ongoing controversy, ongoing thought, and uh, the, 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 there's still more smoke than, uh, than, than uh, blue skies as far as regulation is concerned here. Thank you very much, Bruce. And could I ask you to take down the um, screen share for the next speaker? Yes, sure. And the um, presentation has done a very good job of setting up each of the next two talks. I think the most remarkable statistic is that half of all the mining or more than half of all the mining in Ethereum is connected to this Flashbot MEV. And our next speaker from the Ethereum Foundation is Barnaby Minot. He will talk about what plans are underway and may be implemented to limit the consequences and rein in the problems of MAV. So Barnaby. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Barnaby Mono. I'm a researcher at the Robust Incentives Group, which is a, a research team of the Ethereum Foundation. And today I want to tell you a bit about Ethereum, some of the design principles, some of its economics, and some of the work in progress, because as Bruce mentioned, definitely not done. We have much more to do. So to me, Ethereum is exciting because it's ambitious. Uh, it tries to do a lot of things at the same time. So these are, I would say, my way of summarizing that. Uh, it tries to get maximal satisfaction of, of user preferences over a public cost-efficient network and with minimum rent for the operators. And so I want to go in turn over these, these three different um, sections. So how are we exactly aiming for this maximal satisfaction. So the idea here is that we are offering with Ethereum a general computation model. So you can pretty much do anything that you can program on Ethereum. The key element here is smart contracts, which hold some user state and which respond to user interactions. And via these smart contracts deployed on Ethereum, you can uh, create highly programmable digital assets, but you know them as tokens or, or NFTs. You can create decentralized finance services such as payments, exchanges, or lending. And you can also power uh, other services and institutions such as uh, domain names, identity, decentralized science, DAOs, games, and, and many other uh, non-financial applications too. So the way you do it is more specifically the users who want to use the network and its applications, they send transactions. You can think of them as recipes for, for the outcomes that they want to, to induce. And these transactions, they trigger a code that is held by the, by the smart contracts, which updates the state of Ethereum. For instance, uh, when Bob makes a payment to Alice, uh, the state of Ethereum reflects that Alice's balance is increased. Uh, Alice can swap some tokens for other tokens. Carol can register a domain name in the Ethereum namespace. Uh, David can vote on the DAO. And the reason why um, we're, we're aiming to satisfy these user preferences because well, all of these services, they're valuable. The users have some uh, surplus that they're getting from accessing these services. And by having this general model of computation and the ability to uh, essentially execute any kind of user preference, we aim to have the maximum potential uh, user welfare. So the second part is how do we how do we do this on, on this network and, and how do we keep the network both 
public and, and cost efficient. So first question is, well, who runs the network? And, and uh, here, uh, it's a decentralized system. So we don't want a single point of command that imposes its view of the network at, at all times. So we need the network participants to, to come to consensus over the, over the state of the chain. It's done as Bruce uh, explained, we have a proof of stake based mechanism. And what this mechanism does is it endows uh, a class of agents that are called validators uh, as, as first class protocol operators. So they're responsible for coming to consensus on that view of a ledger. And in particular, they're responsible for making blocks when they are called upon to do so. And they're also held accountable if you observe a safety fault. So for instance, a double spend or validators trying to confuse uh, the rest of the network on, on what is the current view uh, of, of the chain. A bit more details, how do you become a, a validator? So you put money at stake in the native token. The minimum is 32 ETH, which is something like $60,000 today. And because this money is held at stake by the protocol, the protocol is able to either reward the good performance of validators via the block rewards, or penalize validators if they don't do their job properly. And the penalties get higher if you do more important faults. The key thing that I, I want to, to mention is this is all permissionless. So anybody at any time can enter the validator set and exit as of last week. Um, of course, it's a bit of a stretch because 32 is not a trivial amount of money, but as you were able to, to participate in mining pools in proof of work, you can also pool your stake uh, in staking pools to, to be part of, of a virtual validator with other people who have uh, pooled their stake together. And so what are the costs of that system? So the energy cost obviously is, is very, very low, especially compared to, to proof of work. It, it basically went down to almost zero after the merge uh, back in September last year. The main cost now is really the idea that the stake is, is locked by the protocol and, and this capital lockup cost has a social cost. There's a bit of a tension here. There are ways that you can lower the, the cost of capital, for instance, with liquid staking or, or restaking. These allow the validators to have more yield for their stake. So on the one hand, you do increase the demand for staking, but on the other, because the validator stake is used for other things, uh, you may dilute the Ethereum security. So there's a bit of a trade-off here, but I would say that with proof of stake, it's still potentially easier to target an optimal social cost. If, for instance, we decided that there was some quantity of Ethereum security that we felt comfortable with, uh, we would be able to precisely tune um, the, the social cost of that, of that stake lockup. So the second thing about this network is we are trying to scale it. We are trying to, to make as many users uh, use it as possible. This is scalability. We want a higher uh, transaction throughput because this allows uh, users to uh, realize their preferences. But the constraint here is that we want the verification throughput to stay higher than the transaction throughput. So essentially, uh, we want anyone on the network, not just validators, to be able to verify the work that validators are, are doing. So the validator set is tightly controlled by the protocol, but it, it, they can still corrupt the protocol by doing something like a 51% attack. And the only way to, to, to prevent that failure mode is for anyone on the network, honest users, to be able to, to verify the operator work. And so the way forward for Ethereum is to scale the system with rollups which are dependent chains secured by the Ethereum validator set and which are very easy to, to, to verify uh, the work of. And so with that, uh, we obtain, by ensuring that this verification throughput inequality holds, uh, we ensure that anyone can become a network operator, that we have a truly public and cost efficient network. And that in turn gives us the maximum scale and also the operator accountability. So we're able to hold the validators accountable for for what they do. And it's really important and it has some fairly deep uh, consequences on, on, on what I'll talk about in this section, which is we also want to not only keep these validators accountable, but also minimize their rent. So we want to ensure that they can't destroy the network's integrity by doing some kind of fault, but we also want to ensure that they can't abuse their role as first class operators of the network to extract uh, undue rent on the on the users of the network. And this part is, is a little more in the weeds, but uh, I hope you'll follow me there. So let me start by describing three types of values that are 
um, settled on, on Ethereum. So the first is user surplus, which is essentially users by transacting are collecting this surplus, and we want to, to maximize that for users who are on Ethereum. The second type of value is externalities, um, which can be positive, for instance, uh, network effects that provide more value to the users. But they can also be negative, for instance, congestion on the network. These types of value, we, we want to internalize it for the network as a whole. And then the third type of value is operator rent, which we are trying to extract uh, from either of the first two uh, categories. And that value, obviously, we're trying to, to keep it as, as low as possible. So the first type of rent that we can talk about is the idea of congestion rent. So we are trying to scale the network, but obviously we don't have infinite capacity still, which means that whenever the validators are making blocks, they are limited in terms of how many transactions they can put in there. So the block space is scarce, which means that we have an allocation problem. And the way this allocation problem is solved in this pseudonymous environment is that the users have to express their inclusion preferences via uh, fees. There are many papers on the, on the topic, but I'm singling out uh, two of them here. The first one is Monopoly without a monopolist, which is a very interesting paper that shows that with Bitcoin style fee market, uh, operators cannot enforce monopoly pricing. And this is because of a free entry of operators who come in to kind of share the cake if the monoly, monopoly pricing is enforced. But despite this property, you, you still find that the, the allocation is efficient and that users who care more for entering the network are going to be entering uh, faster. So in Ethereum, we, we actually don't really use this Bitcoin style fee market anymore. We have what's called uh, EIP 1559. And the very interesting property of, of this market is that we're able to take this congestion cost that the users are, are paying and internalizing them for the, for the protocol. This is pretty deep because you can think of the operators or the validators as essentially the, the storefront of the Ethereum protocol. And, and they are not necessarily trusted by the protocol to run the store, honestly. So if the protocol tells them you have to give me the fees you get, they can try to go around these, these rules. But in this case, uh, with a bit of mechanism design, uh, it's actually possible to capture the fees that the operators are, are, are getting from the users. And so we remove that rent that the operators are, are getting from, from congestion. But remember that in our case, in, on Ethereum, uh, the operators are still paid uh, by the block reward. Okay. So that was the first rent, uh, congestion pricing. Now there's a second type of rent that people talk about quite a lot, and it's related to MEV, um, which is essentially operator privilege. So the operators, whenever they are chosen to make the block, they have absolute power on what goes inside the block, in what order. So essentially they can insert their own transaction, censor user transaction, or reorder the transaction in, in any way that they want. Uh, this gives them a specific type of power, which I will call last look, and which allows the operator to capture value from externalities. So whenever a user makes a transaction that unlocks some value somewhere, the operator is the best place to, to capture that value. An example of that is, is an arbitrage. So let's say a user makes a swap on, on a market, and now there's a price imbalance with another market. So because the operator is the last one to order the transaction, the operator can directly place after the user transaction, their own transaction, which makes that arbitrage and they pocket the, the difference. And so in the case of arbitrage, it's a pretty important market function. So in that case, the operator does provide a service, but we can see that the last look power can also be used for, uh, let's say more nefarious um, purposes where the operators extract the value from users directly from the user's pocket. And so the most famous example here is something that's called the sandwich attack, where the user makes a swap for, let's say, token A against token B, and the operator in their block is going to place right before the user transaction a swap to buy the, the same asset as the user is trying to buy, and right after the user transaction, sell the asset, which leads to this uh, chain of events where the operator buys the asset for cheap, then the user buys it for high, and then the operator sells it at this, at this high price. And so it's definitely just a zero sum transfer from the, from the user's pocket to the, to the operator. And so this is bad, but at the same time, 
We are not really willing to give up on either the permissionless entry of operators, which means that we can't trust the operator to abide by some rules that we, we tell them. And we also are not willing to give up on this permissionless programmability where any kind of interaction can be can be done by the by the by the platform. And so we can't really outlaw these things. And that sounds a bit pessimistic, but I, I, I think we have better ways to, to fix these things. And I and I want to show you uh, some of them in the in the next few slides. The first element of solution is we are going to try and capture this rent that the operators are, are getting as part of their um, privileged position. So what's happening today is that figuring out these arbitrages, figuring out these sandwiches is actually pretty hard. It, it requires you to run uh, very quickly, very sophisticated algorithms. And so the operator started essentially outsourcing the role of making the block to another entity that is known as, as builders. And you can think of a relationship between uh, validators and builders as almost like a procurement auction where the, the builder is trying to make a block that extracts as much value as possible. And then they're trying to sell that block to the validator or the validator to, to propose it to the rest of the network. And so via this auction, the builder is trying to give away as much of a value as possible to the validator so that they are selected uh, in the auction. So what we're working on now is essentially making the protocol to be the auctioneer in that in that relationship. And, and via a permissionless auction, we are able to not only capture what the builder is, is, is giving to the validator, but forward it to the to the protocol and potentially internalize it. So one way that we do that is simply by removing that value from the from the money supply. And that minimizes the, the rent uh, to the validator. So one more point here. So what you tell me here is, OK, that's great. The protocol is able to capture that rent from the operator. But if the user is getting sandwiched, they're still hurt. So the, the money just goes to this intangible thing that is the network. And so the question is, well, how do we protect the user in the, in the first place without hurting the, the coordination value? And what I'm trying to say here is that by allowing this permissionless programmability of everything can be done on Ethereum, you, you essentially allow yourself to reach these points of maximum coordination value and, and higher social welfare. And so we often times hear that okay, we, we should add this constraint to prevent people from doing certain things. But by adding constraint, if we are not careful, we may also destroy the value that we can obtain via this extra coordination of, of everyone. And so the question is, are we lost? Like, are we kind of uh, stuck between these, these two extremes? And I don't think so. so the reason why I don't think so is the operator may have a last look, but the user ultimately is the one that signs these transactions. So the user has great uh, commitment power. And essentially, they can use tools like cryptography. They can use tools like being selective about who they share their order with. They can program a lot of the execution as, as code and, and protect themselves and realize the, the power that they have. These things are currently being deployed live. So essentially being instantiated on the network. There are many experiments uh, in many different places. You find them as order flow auctions where the user is selling the right to execute their transaction to, to bidders and, and get, capturing back uh, some of the value that they create, things like contextual execution. But there are many, many more probably that will be found in the, in the future, essentially thanks to innovation in both cryptography and, and mechanism design. And to me, this is the, the most exact, exciting place to, to do research in. So I, I would recommend you to check out this, this link here. So the takeaway from this section is when it comes to externalities and when it comes to this extra value that is created, we are trying to reduce or rebate it to the user as much as we can. And if we can't do that, we are trying to at least send that value so that it can be internalized to the network as a whole uh, versus ending uh, in the operator's pocket. And so I think it's a very different way of building systems that we're, we're trying to be equitable. We're trying to find what works for the user first rather than for the operators. And that feels to me like it's a, it's a fairly different paradigm that we are uh, operating in. And that makes it uh, exciting in my, in my opinion. So yeah, that's it for me. That's a few links to, to go further. And, and if that's all interesting to you, uh, please get in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barnaby. And our final speaker will come from the legal world. This is uh, Professor Yasha Yadav from Vanderbilt University, and we'll be speaking about some of the regulatory issues that are now on the front burner concerning Ethereum and other protocols as well.
Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, David. Thank you so much, Kathleen, uh, for the invitation to be here today. It really is such a pleasure and a privilege to get to have this opportunity. Um, thank you so much to Elizabeth for uh, bringing us all together and making this event happen. Um, so I am particularly grateful uh, for the chance to have this conversation with everyone. Um, let's face it, who wants to start their Friday pre uh listening to a lecture from a lawyer? Uh, but uh, given that we are talking about crypto, uh, unfortunately, we really have no choice. Um, and so I wanted to start, uh, given that we are talking about um, Ethereum, uh, to really talk about Ethereum, which is to say that, um, you know, trying to highlight the scale of the problem that is caused by the lack of regulatory certainty, um, the lack of um, understanding about the deeper uh, regulatory principles that are implicated uh, by the blockchain and by Ethereum in particular. Um, so first and foremost, um, looking at Ethereum, you know, this is by all um, by all accounts the operational heartbeat of the crypto economy today. Uh, what we have um, in the Ethereum space um, is the operating system for almost 50% of the, the, the sort of workable decentralized applications that are in progress today that are working today. Um, at the height in 2021, um, approximately $22 billion worth of value was locked um, in, um, in, in the various decentralized applications housed within Ethereum. Um, we have obviously, um, you know, 600,000 active users that are engaging on a regular basis with uh, the decentralized apps that are running on Ether, um, Ethereum. And also, obviously, we have just, you know, an incredible variety of applications, financial products and services, um, you know, from lending protocols that we all know to uh, trading platforms that we're all kind of, you know, uh, that, are, that are becoming increasingly mainstream household names, um, given the popularity emerging of DeFi. In addition, obviously, we have stable coins that are using Ethereum Ethereum uh, for their transmission, right? So by all accounts, right, um, you know, state the absolute, you know, complete obvious, this is uh, market infrastructure. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, this is without question, right, uh, the market structure that is, uh, that is uh, governing the crypto economy today. With one big difference, from the traditional market structure that we're all kind of living and breathing within our more traditional financial markets. Now, our more traditional financial markets, um, you know, as all of you know, and as all of you are, are, you know, very aware of, right, are deeply regulated institutions, right? These are amongst the most incredibly thickly, you know, regulated institutions anywhere within the financial system. Now, um, I, I don't want to go through all the different regulations that we have to deal with. That is 100% not suitable for a Friday morning um, as you get ready for your weekends. Um, but, you know, there are some basic pillars that exist within the sort of financial system that govern the oversight of critical market infrastructure. So to take just the example of, say, like just, you know, random example of, say, the New York Stock Exchange, um, there's some key pillars that, you know, that govern the oversight of the NYSE or NASDAQ, for example. Right. So first and foremost, um, you know, we have an understanding of what rules apply to the New York Stock Exchange. What are the basic quality of the rules that apply to the exchange. So as we know, with the case of the New York Stock Exchange, it is subject to the securities laws. Um, it is subject to the principles and key ideas behind the securities laws, for example, of transparency, disclosure, investor protection. In addition, there's some key rules that apply for who gets to participate on the New York Stock Exchange. Unfortunately, um, you and I, David, Kathleen, we can't just all rock up today and start trading on the floor. We don't have that kind of access. Um, but, you know, some others do. Uh, and these are the regulated broker dealers um, that are subject to, you know, their own sets of rules that govern their conduct, how they behave, how they interact with customers, what duties they have towards customers and so forth. 
In addition, of course, market infrastructure like the New York Stock Exchange has a lot of rules and regulations governing how it keeps itself safe. Right. So we have lots and lots of, you know, um, lots and lots of um, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of principles here to, 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 to govern what kind of resources the New York Stock Exchange needs to keep to ensure it has sufficient prudential safety and soundness. Um, there are lots of, you know, uh, there are lots of provisions in place to ensure that there is continuity, operational resilience and robustness regarding the technology. Right. These are all you know, procedures that exist um, in this space. Now, clearly, this is a very centralized, the New York Stock Exchange and others, a very centralized institution. There is clear um, understanding of who is accountable. Um, and given that you know, you're dealing with a lawyer, what that means is who gets to get sued. Right. So we know exactly um, where the claim needs to get filed um, if the New York Stock Exchange falls short um, in the conduct of its um, in the conduct of its um, activities. Now, obviously, right, um, there is a ton, as Bruce uh, sort of discussed earlier, there is a ton of uncertainty regarding how we think about the regulatory um oversight of Ethereum as a whole, particularly as it grows um, into its role as a critical part of market infrastructure, not just within the crypto economy, but within the more mainstream financial system as a whole. To some extent, there's a, a very clear argument to say that it's already happened, that Ethereum is in fact becoming closer and closer uh, and increasingly uh, more deeply a part of the larger financial system as a whole. So, you know, first and foremost, uh, for those of you who may have tuned in on Tuesday with your popcorn, to watch um, Chair Gensler's testimony at the House, right? The big question in that hearing was, of course, is Ether a security, right? And that goes to the larger question of what are the rules and regulations, the larger governing framework to which Ethereum could potentially be subject outside of the internal code that Ethereum um, operates for itself. Now, the argument here with respect to the question of whether Ether is a security goes to this case that some of you may have heard of called SEC versus Howey. Um, and I apologize for doing this to you. I'm deeply sorry uh, for inflicting this on you. But, you know, Howey has a number of core uh, principles that determine um, what kinds of contracts constitute a security. So in order to have a security, you need an investment of money in a common enterprise for profit and through the efforts of others. And so the argument that is currently being made is that post-merge, Ether is looking more and more potentially like a security. So why is that? Right. This is because um, with staking, that users are now able to stake their Ether, that is an investment of money. Um, that it is in a common, that is being staked within the, the larger protocol, um, that is a common enterprise, a pooling, um, a common pooling, a common enterprise, that there's profit, um, that folks are looking for rewards. Um, and, um, you know, Bruce mentioned that, you know, the rewards are changing, but nevertheless, you know, rewards are a salient part of this uh, of this undertaking that we're looking for rewards. Um, and through the efforts of others, through the larger validator system that exists on Ethereum today, right? So um, that is the argument that is being made to, uh, to, to suggest that, in fact, Ether is a security. And that means that, you know, Ethereum um, has to potentially produce disclosures and have to undergo registration and the like. But this is not a simple debate, right? For those of you who are familiar with securities laws, you know, these cases tend to get, you know, to the Supreme Court for a reason because they are complicated. Um, and so, you know, some questions will arise here. For example, um, when you do staking, um, is there a public good aspect to it? Are the folks that are engaging in staking potentially doing it to maintain the integrity of the network and not just for the rewards or potentially for the integrity purposes uh, more broadly? So the profit prong, for example, um, is attenuated by the larger need for the public good. Um, in addition, obviously, um, the 2A1, the, the section for what is a security in the Securities Act, has a little caveat, unless the context otherwise requires um, this is a security. 
And that big, you know, that line that's often forgotten unless the context otherwise requires raises the question, you know, is the context here amenable to a determination that ether is in fact a security? Is the context here just so difficult given decentralization, given the difficulty of producing disclosures, uh, given the role of staking and maintaining the integrity of the blockchain? You know, are there aspects of the context that would suggest that maybe this is not the right place to call it a security? So there are all of these different questions that go to determining what the larger legal principles involved might be that would govern um, Ethereum. And, you know, one of the discussions that has uh, taken place already is in relation to the key participants and the duties that might be incumbent upon them. As Barnaby just talked about, you know, uh, the major, and as Bruce discussed as well, you know, the major block builders have such a powerful role in maintaining the integrity of how the system is working on a day-to-day -day basis. But of course, as Barnaby discussed, you know, there are some real issues with respect to potential conduct um, in relation to the block builders and specifically their ability to capture private information flows in order to extract rents for themselves, right? So they're seeing the order flows, they're potentially ordering the blocks to favor their own transactions. Um, they're taking rents from that process. In addition, they might not be the only ones. Um, as uh, yeah, as uh, as Bruce talked about, there are other actor, you know, there are other, you know, um, and as as Barnaby raised, there are other actors that are coming in uh, to this process. Users, for example, might be using uh, services to hide their orders. Um, and again, these these third party services, the wallet providers, services to hide their their their, their orders, uh, user orders, may themselves end up being privy to confidential information about the users that can then that they themselves might be uh, you know potentially able to use down the line to extract rents for themselves. Right, so query, right, within the traditional securities framework, you know, these are um, these are very important issues that go to questions of whether there may be potential front running, for example. Right, is there a duty owed by block builders to users and others down the transaction chain that would mean that maybe they should not be able to see this confidential information flow um, and potentially use it um, in order to favor their own interests? And if not the block builders themselves, potentially other third party services down the line, the wallet providers or services that are trying to hide user information, right? Are they in a particularly close position with users that would suggest that maybe they have that little duty towards the users to protect their information flows? Um, so, you know, these are, you know, these are questions about the key participants within this, uh, with, within the system, what kind of duties they have, you know, if any, uh, that they might be subject to. And again, that goes to some larger questions about what kind of framework we're dealing with uh, within, the, within the broader legal context. Now, of course, there are you know, questions about safety and soundness. How does Ethereum maintain its resiliency um, as a market infrastructure provider, right? How do, we, how do we ensure that it is, in fact, as robust and resilient as possible? Now, both Bruce and Barnaby highlighted this kind of trilemma between scalability, decentralization, and security. The more you know, scalable and, and decentralized Ethereum becomes, uh, potentially the you know the greater the faster it becomes there might be trade-offs in relation to security and certainly you know um, there have been suggestions for example too that post merge um, that using the proof of stake model over the proof of work model may in fact expose ethereum to greater risks here um, for one the protocol becomes a much more attractive target um, just you know for hackers and other malicious actors uh, given the values that are involved here that are within the protocol in addition, obviously, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, general considerations of how the network is able to function, preventing potential malicious block builders from trying to sabotage others in order to get value for themselves. You know, these are these are all, you know, considerations that go to questions of how Ethereum maintains its safety and soundness. How does it keep itself 
working here. Um, so you know there are there are some there are some key issues that might arise within the sort of ra- larger regulatory context, which is to say, you know that updates that are happening. Uh, Bruce talked about Shanghai and 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 obviously the merge itself. You know, do these updates potentially have to go through some kind of regulatory exercise? What is the process here? Um, is there a process here that you know regulators might want to have you know greater insight into? Um, when exchanges, for example, are uh, proposing changes to their systems, the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq, if they are, you know, undertaking changes with respect to how they run themselves, these changes have to go through a process um, to publicize what they're doing to get, you know, the regulator to essentially sign off on it. Um, and so, you know, this process is something that's supposed to maintain the overall recognition that the market infrastructure is not just operating for itself, but that it's providing a public good that creates larger externalities for the system as a whole. And so having that regulatory check um, for the changes that are being made is something that, you know, is a critical part of that larger uh, recognition. And so clearly, you know, questions arise here as to whether or not regulators might want to get involved, and if so, how they, um, how you know, they might they might think about doing so. Um, and so, like the the kind of final point, the final slide, and I'm not sure um, how much time I have, but probably not that much. Um, you know, goes to questions of governance, which is to say, who are the folks that are accountable in the event that something goes wrong. And here, the legal scholars have been engaging in a larger debate about the notion of decentralization itself, right? How decentralized is, in fact, decentral? You know, the, the 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 network. In other words, are there locuses? Are there places where there is, in fact, some degree of centralization, or otherwise, at least some level of identifiability of the key actors that are involved in this process? Now, certainly for Ethereum, you know, there are very much um, there is uh, there is um, debate around the role of the Ethereum Foundation, for example, as a key actor. Um, Vitalik um, is a very visible figure uh, within the you know, within the ecosystem, as well as within the larger dialogue that is surrounding blockchain and blockchain governance more broadly. So clearly there is some, uh, you know, there is some a notion that there are important people within the Ethereum organization, within the Ethereum, um, within the Ethereum ecosystem. Could they be recognized as actors that could constitute anchor points for implementing regulation should it arise, right? So here the big question becomes, if one is supposed to get Ethereum to register or provide disclosure or engage in some kind of exercise about protecting its users in a, in a certain um, prescriptive way, um, that does do these centralized points of identifiability, for example, the foundation or certain actors, um, do they constitute the ways in which that implementation could take place? So these are debates that are currently underway? Is this a a viable uh, debate even to be having? Is this something that the the foundation and other key actors, could they even do this? These are are the big debates that are happening within the legal system as it pertains to thinking about the Ethereum uh, blockchain and its its regulation, as well as um, others, obviously, um, along along similar lines. But as much as the discussion here is happening um, with respect to the law, um, there is really a huge amount of difficulty with respect to DeFi. Um, One last point, David is here, so I know I need to go. I apologize, David, I'm done, last line. Um, Which is to say that even when we have you know, a, a, a regulatory clarity in some cases. So, for example, the EU today is, you know, passed MICA, the Market in Crypto Assets Regulation, their big comprehensive um, framework for crypto regulation. It does not include DeFi, right? So DeFi is, a, is carved out from many different um, attempts at creating, creating regulatory clarity because DeFi you know, far more than any other part of the crypto ecosystem is extremely conceptually difficult for us lawyers that are used to thinking about accountability in pretty, um, you know, uh, constricted terms. So with that, um, I'm going to let you guys off um, and, uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you, David.
Thank you, Yesha. And don't go away yet. There's um, We have about two minutes. There's a couple questions in the Q&A. The first one is deeply philosophical, and Angad Banga asks, to what degree does regulation make Ethereum a moot point? How does regulation work in a blockchain ecosystem? And if I could sharpen the question just a little bit, we have a saying in finance that smart money drives out dumb. And you see this with MEV, that these very naive speculators get their lunch eaten by people who really know what's going on. Why shouldn't we let that just run its course? Yeah, and I think that that debate's been happening in finance for a long time. But, you know, there's this, for, for those of us that are, you know, and David, obviously, as you know, like for those of us that do market structure, there is this, there is this tension between having a marketplace that is diverse and, and, and big and inclusive and getting all these heterogeneous actors. So one does, in fact, get dumb as well as smart money involved. Um, and so providing execution that helps them feel safe to do that, um, you know, having that tension with with basically predatory behavior that could dissuade folks from coming in because they feel like they are not going to be able to get their trade done at the price point that they want that trade to happen. They feel like that actors within the process will use that order flow information to uh, to extract rents for themselves. And so that's why we have these rules, um, you know, for broker dealers to prevent things like front running. But we don't have them for market makers um, who do, in fact, get to see order flow. And then just to jump ahead, this is particularly the case, for example, example, with um, HFTs, you know, that's a, a normal model in that context. But the larger philosophical point here is straightforward. Like if we do regulate Ethereum in the using conventional tools, does that change the nature of the whole gig, right? Like it's supposed to be uh, something that essentially is more self-regulating, I suppose, uh, through code. Um, uh, and so does this change that nature, you know, versus the tension between it becoming a, a part of the financial system more, more profoundly. And so the externalities that creates, does that need to be addressed through some kind of top-down uh, discussion? <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I do want to respect the clock. We're out of time. And I, I have a feeling this discussion could go on much longer if we yeah. allowed it to. Let me thank all three of the panelists for being with us today. And Kathleen, it's back to you now. Great. No, thank you, David and, and panelists. I think this is one of the most intriguing aspects of this conference where we get to bring together folks who don't often get to sit in the same room. And it's just fantastic to hear from the forefront of academic research. And we have another great panel uh, later this afternoon as well. And thank you also for resetting the conversation and reminding us about convergence in technology and getting us away from uh, that burning fire of FTX that kind of sucked all the air out of the room. So thank you very much.